Welcome to Loop TV. I'm your host, Gene Munster, along with Loop's Doug Clinton. Our topic today is Web 3.0, and what better time to be talking Web 3.0 when two of the titans, Elon Musk and Jack Dorsey, have recently commented on the topic. I want to give you a very high view of what they have recently said, and then bring in Doug, and we can uh, reconstruct Web 3.0. Elon says uh, Web 3.0, I'm loosely quoting him here or, or paraphrasing him here, it, that it is more uh, buzz and marketing than substance. And Jack Dorsey says that this is something uh, that will be the opportunity will be owned by venture capitalists. And so that is the, the setup here and bring Doug in and maybe just as a starter, if uh, we're gonna start with the conclusion here, do you land more in Elon's camp? And I'm going to put a context on this Web 3.0 over the next uh, maybe let's say three years. Uh, do you are you more in Elon's camp or Jack's camp? Uh, probably. I mean, it's it's like choosing between right and left. I think I choose the third option, which is you know up, <laughs> which I think is uh, probably that there are some merits to what both of them are saying. But I think the reality is this, and we talk about Web3, and we can, we can go into what, what that is because it's kind of, it is a buzzword. I think to Elon's point, we hear it thrown around a lot. And I don't know if uh, when people talk about it, they even have the same definition. I think there are certainly some emerging components of Web3 that are very real. They're very important to the future of the web. But like most emerging technologies, I think it will take time to really gain adoption and affect the way that people actually live. Do you want to define Web 1.0? I can do one, two, and three in order. Web 1.0, I would say, was think of the very earliest iteration of the web, email, instant messaging, search. You know, it was, it was the very basic functions, the underpinnings, I think, that have uh, sort of enabled us to build what we have today in the web. But I really think Web 1.0 was, was defined by search, you know, being able to go and find anything on the internet Google really unlocked that, and that was that was the defining moment there. Web 2.0 was defined by so. Second on Web 1.0, would you say that sure. uh, loosely was 1995 to 2010? Uh, a little narrower, I'd say probably more like 95 to 2005, uh, because that is when when Facebook really kicked in, and I think 2005 Facebook started in 04, if I remember correctly, and they really jump started the social revolution. I mean, MySpace was before Facebook. Uh, it was Facebook before Facebook, but it didn't last long in, in the face of Facebook. Um, but I mean, Web2 was, was all about social and the network of all of the people in the world, how we interact with each other, generating content, whether that's YouTube or Twitter or TikTok now. Uh, Web2 to me is really all about that social layer. And then that has given way to Web3. Okay, Which so we're, curr too, if yeah, you're currently in, we're currently in, uh, safely in Web 2.0, though. I would say we're safely in Web 2.0. You might argue some people have even described sort of a Web 2.5. So we're maybe on the tail end of Web 2.0, but moving toward Web 3, which is really enabled by some of these crypto protocols. Okay. So Web3, to me, uh, the defining character characteristic, if one was search, two was social, three is decentralization. And I think in some ways that too has been a buzzword very much associated with uh, crypto. But what Web3, I think, is all about is sort of returning uh, the network to the users rather than having uh, corporate ownership of the network. And there is one very specific reason why I think Web3 is important and it will eventually tie into our discussion about the metaverse. But Web3 is to me about sort of verifiable and undeniable ownership of digital assets. Having a decentralized blockchain, Ethereum obviously is, is the leader there, the one that I think we, we should probably assume, uh, assume that mantle. Uh, having that sort of ownership layer that nobody is in control of, but that a very large number of people trust to say, you know, Doug owns this, Gene owns this, and they can trade these assets on the web. What Web3 does that I think is really exciting is finally enables And that. so we're talking about, when we talk decentralization and assets, we of course are talking about uh, virtual assets, correct? 
Correct. Yep. And I think you could extend it and say, you know, really any financial asset. That's what I think crypto has sort of become. It's it's the native money of the internet, really. And obviously it can be traded for physical assets, but but you're right, it's it's meant to denote sort of digital ownership of digital things. And using the web 2.0 analog, when social started, it was originally thought to be something limited to college students. And and here we are, like you said, uh, influencers, here we are on a video uh, YouTube channel, and, and it's an example of web 2.0 playing out. When you think about uh, maybe at the time it started, it would felt niche when you describe these uh, digital assets and talk about crypto or NFTs and say that's the piece that's gonna get decentralized, uh, that still seems niche to me. And do you uh, foresee uh, taking uh, you know, this to uh, 10 years plus out, uh, what does kind of describe what our lives look like uh, when we need these decentralized platforms for virtual um, goods? I'll walk back from the 10 years out thing and, and describe why I think the decentralization component is important. Um, and I actually think, and this may be also a, a somewhat of a contrarian view, the average person right now that uses the internet doesn't care about decentralization. The reason that decentralization is critical though, is that having this uh, database that understands who owns what that's not controlled by anybody is going to be this sort of underpinning layer for everything you do in the future. So when you talk about 10 years out, I don't know what that'll look like. I mean, it could be very similar to what we're doing now. We could still be doing things on Zoom and, and have crypto protocols and we're trading NFTs, or we could be in this metaverse that I think a lot of people describe, which maybe is more oriented around VR. I think that the decentralization component of it is very important for the protocol. But when it comes to technologies and services that real people use, I don't think they care if it's decentralized or not. They just want it to work. The trend of crypto to me right now is, is up. Whether people having more digital assets means more things like Bitcoin or Ether um, or things like NFTs, I think it could be all of the above, maybe some more than others. And, and there will be probably scores and scores and scores, maybe thousands of new digital assets that are created and asset classes that are created over that five to 10 year period that represent all sorts of different types of ownership on the web. And we'll look back and say, it's hard to imagine life without these. That's right. Just like I think we, we look back now and say, imagine life without Zoom, imagine life without Facebook, imagine mm -hmm. life without Google, you know, you couldn't live without it. Um, web three might be a little more like saying, imagine life without email, which I think web three in some ways could be analogous to that, but it's just super important because, uh, regardless of who is, is offering that skinned layer on top of web three, uh, the ownership is, is sort of, uh, I would say protected from, uh, these centralized organizations that, that might do something that users don't like. Um, I want to end with a thought on the metaverse and how the metaverse vectors in the web 3.0? Yeah, I think uh, you get into sort of a definitional question, which is, you know, sort of what is web 3.0? I think we've described it here as this, this really ownership layer for the digital world. And I think the metaverse, people have different views on it. I know some people think the metaverse is very much a sort of VR immersive uh, sort of world. Gene, I think that is probably your view of the metaverse. My view is a little bit less about immersion and more about uh, the sort of interconnected layer that sits on top of these Web3 protocols. So to me, I think about Web3 as this, this sort of under, underpinning where we have a common understanding of who owns what. And then the metaverse on top of it is sort of how we all interact with one another and where we're spending time, whether that's on traditional 2D social networks, whether that's in VR, AR, to me, it doesn't really matter as much. I think it's more just about the interface layer where Web3 is the ownership layer. Got it. So the question that comes up, some people use Web3.0 and the metaverse interchangeably. Some people will refer to it as, uh, you know, there's a, a line uh, between Web3.0 and a progression to the metaverse. Your view is that the metaverse is built on top of Web3.0. On behalf of Doug and a, a good history lesson and a good look forward, uh, regarding how the internet has been progressing. On behalf of Doug, Gene, myself, and Loop TV, bye for now.